Okay, hello and welcome to Access. This is the second part of my interview with Joanne Norton, who's here representing LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And uh, Joanna and LEAP want to do away with the war on drugs. They think it's destructive and cruel, and that far from being a, a, a gateway drug, marijuana has just been a gateway to the presidency because um, our, our last three presidents have all used marijuana and possibly other things as well. Uh, okay, Joanna, uh, re repeat what it is, what, what LEAP is, you know, just briefly, um, what it is you seek to do, and most of all, how police people, people in law enforcement, are coming out and saying, we've been doing the wrong thing here. We should not be putting people in prison for uh, th these drug offenses. Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP, is an organization that was founded by five police officers who had worked um, fighting the war on drugs, who finally realized that it's not working. Not only is it not working, it's hurting. It hurts people. And so they began this organization. And those of us who speak on behalf of the organization have been involved um, with law enforcement. Uh, LEAP, in fact, has many, many, many members, and anyone can join and be a member. But those of us who speak on behalf of the organization have been um, law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, judges, police officers, um, federal agents, um, all of us, we realize that we're doing the wrong thing. And because it, it's obvious that we're doing the wrong thing. Drugs today are cheaper than ever, more available than ever, and purer than ever before. So obviously, we're, we're not um, keeping drugs out of the country. We have not, we're nowhere near a drug-free America. There's no such thing. Um, and LEAP is an organization that's our mission is to educate people because Americans are not getting the information about all of these drugs that they ought to be getting. Now, Bernard Carrick, were you with the police department when he was commissioner? I was not. He was a little after my time. But um, <laughs> he went to prison, um, not a role model for police commissioners. He went to prison, and he has been, in and just got out recently, and has been interviewed. And uh, he, too, is Talking yeah, about that's, a, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, he was on Meet the Press. Did you see him on Meet the Press? He put a five cent piece in the interviewer's palm, David Gregory's palm, and said, Now that doesn't, that's not very heavy, is it? That doesn't weigh a lot. And Gregory said, No. And he said, Well, you know, for that amount of heroin, you can go to jail forever 10 years, yeah. 12 years, yeah. whatever it was. And he said, It makes no sense. But the fascinating thing to me is when he was asked why, nothing's done about it, he said, we didn't think about the important things when I was police commissioner. And it, it's, it's something that happens in police departments and in government. We get sidetracked onto things that are unimportant, and here we were cluttering up the prisons and ruining families with, the, with these strict drug laws. Now, if Bernard Carrick can convert, anybody can convert. Uh, it, it seems to me. And he got a close-up look, up close and personal, at what the war on drugs can do. Um, I, I, however, I want to be sure that we understand that police departments, police officers don't set policy. It's the politicians who set policy. And it's the politicians who decide what will be law and what will not be law. Um, police officers um, enforce the law. So it is important that police officers, as well as anybody else, um, take another look at the war on drugs. But we cannot have changes, no matter how many police officers change their minds, until politicians um, decide to face reality and work up the courage 
to enact legislation. Okay, what ended prohibition of alcohol in the early 1930s? And the historians come more and more to believe it was because if they made it legal, they could tax it. And, and, and they, they were losing money enforcing it, and there was money to be made legalizing it. And now I understand the state of Colorado has what amounts to a 25% tax on the marijuana there, which is legal, a 15% excise and 10% sales tax that is producing millions of dollars for the city, medical marijuana for the city in Oakland, California. So th th this, what, what I'm saying is, wouldn't politicians like to have something that frees police to take care of violent crime and brings in money? I would hope so. However, because of all of the misunderstanding, all of the misinformation about drugs, it's still a very risky thing for a career politician to do. Um, you're right about what's happening in places like California and Colorado. Um, California has medical marijuana, and there are cities there that, because of uh, the fact that the medical marijuana is taxed, are closing uh, budget holes, are um, bringing in money legitimate money, money that would go to the drug cartels yeah. instead. It's the drug cartels that are now making billions of dollars globally. Um, if we regulate, legalize, regulate um, all of these drugs, we can tax them as well. That makes sense. Um, and this has been the experience of uh, California, at least, as far as medical marijuana is concerned. Um, there are benefits to be obtained from legalizing, regulating, and taxing. Um, regulating. Who cards your kid on the street when he wants to buy marijuana or heroin or cocaine or anything else? Does the dealer the illegal dealer, the underworld dealer, say to your kid, how old are you, kid? I'm not going to sell it to you unless you're um, 21. Nobody does that. Nobody uh, who makes an illegal sale is carding anybody. You can't buy alcohol. You can't buy uh, tobacco without being old enough. But you can buy any drug on the street, no matter yeah. how young you are. And it's all prohibited. Well, now, what, what, what can, um, excuse me, what can marijuana be positive for in a medical sense? What, uh, what illnesses or afflictions does it relieve? Well, we know that uh, people who have cancer, who are undergoing um, the effects of chemotherapy, for example, uh, have found um, a great deal of relief from marijuana. I can tell you about a, a woman that I know, a woman even a little bit older than I am, a grandmother, uh, a woman who lives on the Upper East Side of Manhattan who was suffering the effects of chemotherapy. She is an upstanding member of the community. She went out on the street and stopped people, stopped strangers, until she could find somebody who would help her get marijuana. Stop well, what strangers. about her doctor? Doctors can't um, prescribe marijuana. Well, well, it's interesting. I have a friend who had cancer and died recently and for her entire life. And she was in the medical field. She was a dean of nursing at the University of Washington. And she believed and she was a scientist. She believed that marijuana was an evil street, glove, uh, street uh, drug. And then when she found, she didn't want to take opiates. And when she got cancer and it became painful, she went to her doctor and said, I want to use marijuana. And the doctor said, that's good. I'm for it. And she said, where do I begin? And he said, I don't know. Uh, and this was in a state where marijuana was legal, the state yeah. of Washington. So she asked around, and she found that there was a pusher in the emergency room 
of the hospital. So she got the drug through the pusher, who since marijuana has become legal, is now an entrepreneur. A and legitimate he's, businessman. Yeah, and he's Starbucking. <laughs> he's, he's at the Starbucks marijuana all over Seattle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she brought, him to, she brought him to give a lecture at her retirement home, and he gave her a pot plant <laughs> as a present. She put that, you know, and, and she was so conservative. Uh, yeah. She was upset that I used an, a chiropractor. So, okay, so what are we going to do here? Here you have the doctors who are scientists who presumably could figure out the right mix, the right dosage yes. of marijuana in drops, is how she took it. Uh, so we're, we're full, you know, how do we catch up here? And she was from Washington. My friend was from New York. So at least it's legal, but it, it, no one knows yet. And doctors have to be educated, but I think they will be, especially in progressive areas where uh, marijuana is legal. At least your friend got it from a medical professional. Um, my friend had to get it from, from gangsters. I sure. mean, she didn't know what she was getting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, isn't there a certain mixture of when, you, when you're using it as a palliative, when you're fighting pain? If uh, I were a doctor, I should know that. Yes. And, and I don't know, but doctors, well, doctors should know. Well, doctors didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have a long way to go, but that's the right, the right track. That's yeah. the right way to go. Do you, do you ever encounter any conspiracy theorists about why the, the war on drugs has gone on so long and what started out with marijuana? Uh, I don't like using the term conspiracy theorists because it's a derogatory term and they might be right. Uh, here we have marijuana outlawed for 80 years. Uh, well, against the wishes of the American Medical Association. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is big al is a big alcohol against it? Is big tobacco against it? Um, is um, I don't you know, know. The, the the civil service involved with the war on drugs against it? And there's certainly the prisons you mentioned in the last half hour. Uh, well, the privately run prisons. We have in this country what I think is an abomination. Uh, fortunately, we don't have them in New York, uh, private prisons. I think they're an abomination because um, when a citizen is punished by government, it is government's responsibility to make sure that they are treated uh, at least, at the very least, constitutionally. Um, when uh, states um, give up that requirement, that responsibility to private industry, um, states are still responsible, but there's, there's a gap. And um, private prisons have a vested interest in keeping crimes, crimes. They have a vested interest in getting as many people into their uh, prisons as they possibly can. So they have a vested interest in keeping uh, drugs illegal. Um, uh, drug testing industries also have do an awful lot of lobbying uh, because every time some young person, young or old, uh, applies for a job, um, mm. no matter what the job is, they almost always have to pee in the bottle to prove that they're not on drugs. Yeah, yeah. Well, drug yeah. testing companies. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you something on another, in, a, in a different vein. When you were an undercover policewoman uh, in the narcotics squad and you started out feeling a certain zeal, certain zealotry in sure. pursuing this, did you begin to feel a kind of closeness and guilt at, at, at what you were doing, or was it something that, that uh, came afterwards? Um, um, guilt is something that I generally don't feel about anything I've ever done. Because oh, good for you. It's, it's a waste. Yeah, all right. Whatever I did, I did um, because I believed it was the right thing to do. Um, I, I look back now and I may be sorry about some of what happened, but 
I didn't make the laws. And I didn't think what I was doing was wrong. I did my best. Um, so I, um, and now not everybody feels the same way. I've heard some of, um, some people in league talk about feeling guilt. I'm just the wrong person um, to talk about guilt because I did my best. I did my best like most cops and I did what I was required to do and what I thought was right and what was lawful and what uh, society wanted me to do. Um, I wasn't on some sort of campaign. I didn't take it personally, um, but it was the wrong thing to do. It was the wrong thing. What do you see happening in the next 10 years? I'm moving this because I'm getting static. Oh. Yeah, so uh, what, what, what do you see happening in the, and now it's good. What do you see happening in the next 10 years in terms of the uh, war on drugs, the decriminalization and the legalization? It's hard to predict, but I think as far as marijuana is concerned, we know that most Americans believe that it ought to be legal. So I think, um, grudgingly, um, most states will go along with, uh, will recognize what uh, most people are saying. Um, unless we have education, unless we have something to counter the misinformation uh, that's out there, it's going to take an awfully long time before we see the end of the war on drugs completely. The media, everybody loves to blame the media, but uh, the, the media, news programs, um, even television programs, fiction, um, really have to start looking at drugs more realistically and stop publicizing um, the hysterical uh, misinformation. Um, there's been an awful lot of hysteria about the war on drugs, about drugs, um, which results in the misinformation. People have got to learn that there are an awful lot of upstanding Americans who uh, go to work every day, who support their families, who use drugs, who use illegal drugs. Yeah, yeah. What about the federal, drug, the federal local or federal state conflict? Uh, apparently there was concern in, in the state of Washington that the, uh, that the Drug Enforcement Administration would come in and start enforcing the federal law and preempt the state law. Well, uh, the federal government can do that. Yes. Um, yeah, and apparently there's a certain uneasy peace now? Apparently. The Constitution has what's called the Supremacy Clause. And if federal law and state law conflict, federal law um, supersedes. So apparently at this point, um, the feds have agreed the Department of Justice that they are not going to enforce federal law in Washington and, and Colorado. But eventually what has to happen is the law has to come into line with reality and with fact. I believe with prohibition of alcohol, um, it ended not only because we needed money, but also because the states decided many of the states decided that they didn't like it either. So the federal government was not the leader in that situation, and I don't think, I, I think we see it's not gonna be the leader in this situation either. But eventually the federal government is gonna to have to fall in line with what the states want. Uh, you don't think it can, it'd be the other way around where the uh, states will have to back off? The, That's uh, how it's been up until now but especially as far as marijuana is concerned, um, I think the handwriting is on the wall that um, the states will prevail. I think that it's pretty clear that um, many of the states, many of the states have legalized uh, medical marijuana. And um, it's just another step for people to say, I can get it if I have a problem, if I have a medical problem, why can't I get marijuana if I just want to get high? Why shouldn't adults be allowed to, oh, uh, yeah. to I do agree. that? Yeah, sure. 
Well, I agree. It's only right. another step before people who agree that medical marijuana is okay before they realize that. Well, what is the situation in New York be. State now? Did the assembly pass? Well, you tell us. What is the situation here? Uh, the situation is that in places like New Jersey, they have medical marijuana, uh, but not New York. Why? Oh, God knows. I don't know why. In New York, small amounts have been decriminalized, but that's something nobody has known about either. But that's unofficial, right? No, that's lawful. That's, that's the law. But what has happened is that people have gotten arrested for possessing small amounts of marijuana because after they complied with the officer's order that they empty out their pockets, now it's in plain view, and the law says if it's in plain view, then they may be prosecuted. While it was in their pockets, it wasn't in plain well, view and was not against the law. Well, I understand now this information is four years old, and the latest, the latest data, which is 2009, that arrests for possession of marijuana have gone, or some violation, have increased. So here you're having, you know, legalization, decriminalization, medical marijuana, and more people are being arrested. I mean, you, you know, it's uh, duh. It's 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 1984 here. I mean, I know. Uh, I know. Um, you have to thank the politicians. You have to look, as far as New York is concerned, I've been saying this for a long time, you cannot let the mayor and the police commissioner off the hook. They're the ones in the background, and people are so angry at the police um, for stopping and frisking, for example, and, and that's been done mostly for, for drugs. You can't blame them. Blame the mayor. Blame the police commissioner, because they know what's going on. Um, they know that police officers have, and prosecutors, they know that police officers have is, been arrested. Is there, are there any, is there any legislation now pending in Albany? That, you know, I, I don't know where I got it, but, but it's something past the uh, assembly, but the Senate, which is dominated by Republicans, is burying it or something? You yeah. know more about it than I do. Well, I don't know much about I it. I never get excited yeah. about anything until it actually becomes law and is signed by the governor because yeah, so much sure, can but, happen. But there might be progress or, I, of some I, kind or you know something, some kind of movement. I testified at a hearing before the New York City Council um, regarding medical marijuana uh, in favor of it, obviously, but they, um, they decided not to do it. They turned it down. So they keep trying, and eventually um, there'll be progress. Do you have any idea what the vote was when they turned it I down? I do not. I it do wasn't not. whether it was close or yeah, not. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, All right, where, where do you go from here now? It's been great having you out here, <laughs> and you're enlightening our, you know, some of our public officials you have interviews with. Uh, what, what next for you and LEAP? Well, it LEAP's... Um, goal is to educate. So I will go wherever anybody is interested in having somebody speak about uh, the topic. Um, I have spoken before um, law schools, um, colleges, um, Lions Clubs. Um, I, I'll speak to any group. What kind of reception do you get as a rule? Is that a, a, generally very courteous and interested, I imagine? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I speak to um, conservative organizations. I don't mean politically, uh, but socially conservative. And it's very hard to come up with an argument um, in support of continuing what we're doing. It's very hard. Um, there are no good arguments to support continuing along this but road. But is, isn't there a kind of fear of a, of a counterculture that survives from the 60s, <laughs> 50 years later? I mean, it seems to me, you know, that marijuana is associated with, with kids with long hair and yeah. uh, loose sex and, yeah. and uh, you know, and I still encounter that. I still, yeah. Think, yeah. So? Uh, so do you <laughs> encounter it? <laughs> do you hear this? I, I don't I, hear that. Um, 
yet. Maybe, maybe people don't want to sound silly, even though they may think that. Um, the, the counterculture was responsible for ending the war on, on uh, Vietnam. Yeah. The counterculture was responsible for uh, getting a civil rights act. Uh, the counterculture was responsible for uh, allowing um, women into the professions and into the schools, into the professional schools. So I don't know what's terribly bad about uh, the counterculture of the 60s. Well, I thought it was pretty, it's, pretty it's, progressive. It's, and it's, I was there. A lot of people who complain about what went on in the 60s haven't there. a clue, haven't a clue, weren't there. A lot of them who complain weren't there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay Joanne. Thank you so much for coming out here. Um, now, if people want to contact LEAP, would you repeat how they should do that? Go online to leap.cc, leap.cc, join us. Um, it doesn't cost anything, and you're not going to get a whole lot of uh, junky emails, uh, but you'll find out what's going on. So join us at leap.cc. Okay. Joanne, Joanne Norton, uh, representing LEAP, and to me, representing common sense and uh, a, a humanness. And, and thank you very much, Joanne, for coming out here. My and, pleasure, Richard. And doing Happy. this. Okay. Happy to do it. Yeah.